stun grenades, tear gas, water cannons, and horse-mounted police were deployed against Israelis protesting the judicial overhaul on Wednesday. Images of a wall of citizens of all ages holding Israeli flags standing defiantly opposite a line of mounted armed law enforcement headlined Israeli media and were seen all over the world. These images are galvanizing and, to many, terrifyingly indicative of what will follow once the reforms go through. Because despite the massive protests, according to many experts, they're sure to go through. What matters now is, then what? This is a moment of decisions. That's not a bad thing. Moments of decision are painful, but they're not bad. That's my colleague Chaviv Retegur, the senior analyst for the Times of Israel. We've worked together for over 15 years, and I always respect his ironic blend of optimistic realism when looking at the bigger picture. Every single issue that is now burning on the Israeli agenda, that is now tearing the Israeli people apart, isn't new. Nothing that's happening now is new. The Supreme Court fight and the debate and the screaming and the shouting and the questioning of whether we have a democracy and where it's going... All of it is very, very old. This week, while parts of Israel are burning, we ask Chaviv Retegur, what matters now? Khaviv Rektegur is joining me in my home today. Another very packed day with protests everywhere throughout the country, with legislation being pushed through in the Knesset, with many, many leaders calling for and against the judicial overhaul. Before we begin, I just want to quote what the former Attorney General Avichai Mandelblit said this week at a high-level conference, that essentially we are experiencing a regime coup not so-called legal reform, and that is the founding fathers of the nation's desire that the Attorney General and the High Court of Justice are the two lines of defense to protect democratic liberty. And essentially, he said that it is the High Court's duty to strike down all of this judicial overhaul. At the same time, we also reported that European diplomats are surprised by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's perceived inability to rein in his far-right coalition partners. And so, Khaviv, I ask you, what matters now? I think, Amanda, that we're seeing a country tilting into a, a kind of, certainly an emotional civil war. Whether violence uh, actually erupts in the streets is something uh, we don't know yet. I hope not. We weathered the disengagement, which was very painful, and uh, the Oslo process, the Rabin assassination. We're not a country that easily descends into civil war, even when the political rhetoric feels that way. But we're in that political rhetoric, and um, and and I think that's what matters now. It's it's not so much the substance. Um, there there are really two debates happening in Israel today. There's a debate about the substance of the judicial reform, and then there's a deeper debate about the intent and about the identity war, the culture war. Um, the Israeli left feels that it is under siege and that the country is going to very, very quickly be taken from it. The Israeli right feels that it finally has a chance to correct a historic wrong that has reined it in undemocratically for two generations, and it's been talking that way for two generations. And so everything is very, very visceral, and it's it's very difficult to imagine any kind of dialogue that might create a better reform, the reform that a majority of the country really wants. Now, Khaviv, you have a very interesting hypothesis that even if Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu wanted to halt this train that is chugging right ahead of a judicial overhaul, he actually cannot and, and stay in power, essentially. So why do you say that, first of all? I think there are two elements. The first element is is the emotional one, and the second is the way that Israeli coalitions work. The emotional element is that when the Israeli political right, Yariv Levin, the justice minister, Simcha Rotman, the religious Zionism party member of Knesset, who chairs the Knesset Law and Constitution Committee, when they began pushing this legislation forward, they did so 
in, in legislative terms with brutality. I mean, they, they, they scheduled um, the votes very, very quickly. They presented the bills, you know, one after the other in this kind of a blitz. And these are dramatic, really dramatic reforms that go very, very far. And even many on the right have suggested we need a compromise. But they want to have a compromise the moment before it's passed so that they're in a position of power. And the result, they're, they're in a, a favorable position to have the final result be closer to what they want. Um, but the result of those tactics has been to let half the country feel that it is really, you know, a, a, that there's really a war against it. Uh, the fear on the left is very, very palpable. The problem with that emotional state generated by that political behavior is that it makes it very hard to dialogue. Uh, if the base is frightened, the political leadership has to show that it is standing up for the base. And when you're standing up for the base and declaring this a war on democracy, it's awfully hard to compromise. And so we're seeing on both left and right, you know, the right, because the left won't come to the table to compromise, the right is now left having to do the compromise itself and realizing that it itself doesn't have the political window to do that, the political maneuvering room on the right wing base. And so we're, we're actually, um, we're actually in a position where both sides have climbed up these, you know, these ladders that they can't come down off of. The other problem is, is the coalition itself. The Netanyahu government is composed of different parts. They're fairly uniform in their overall agenda, but but they still are very different parties that represent different constituencies. And each constituency needs to pass a different part of the reform. Okay, so that is very interesting. Let's just break it down very simply into each party that makes up the coalition and what they need and what they cannot let go of. So let's start with Shas. Shas has had a very interesting position um, on two points that it really can't compromise on. The first point uh, has to do with basic laws. Shas leader Arya Derry is a man who has been a serial, um, you know, indictee and conv convictee uh, on corruption charges. Uh, 30 years ago, his corruption trial came to the Supreme Court, which required him in 1993 to be fired from the Rabin government, destabilizing in many ways the Rabin government, um, actually slowing down the Oslo process and in the eyes of many on the right, delegitimizing it because uh, Shas leaving the Rabin coalition cost the Oslo peace agreement, a Jewish majority in the Knesset, which is very symbolic, certainly on the right. And so 30 years ago, the question of Arya Derry's corruption trial forcing him out of the cabinet uh, was one of the moments when the Israeli Supreme Court really began what we now see as 30 years of just a huge uh, inflation of activism, just the court filling every available space and, and really ruling on policy and just becoming this incredibly activist court, the likes of which doesn't really exist in the rest of the developed world. And now, of course, <laughs> a few a couple months ago, uh, the Israeli Supreme Court, 30 years later, once again ruled that Arya Derry, because he is an ex-con, cannot sit in 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 the uh, in the cabinet. And so Shas is now advancing uh, an amendment to the Israeli basic laws that is personal. It's an amendment to our constitutional laws that allows specifically for Arya Derry to be the uh, a minister in the cabinet. I happen to personally believe that the Supreme Court shouldn't rule on who's in the cabinet. That's a decision that is so deeply political and so deeply part of the structure of politics that it should be something that the Knesset determines and that the government determines. And, and that this idea that it's inappropriate or would, would somehow cheapen the government or cause people to turn away from government in disgust is, is not a legal reasoning. It's not... It's not so I, it's not that I disagree with the substance of the rights argument that the court mis overstepped. It's that Shas is using basic laws in ways that call into question the intent of the reform. One major plank of this reform is to make basic laws immune to judicial review. As Simcha Rothman has argued, basic laws are constitutional. That's what the court has been saying for 30 years. Well, there's no court on earth that can judicially review the Constitution, that can declare the Constitution unconstitutional. And the Israeli Supreme Court has claimed the right in principle, it's never actually done it, but it's claimed the right in principle in other rulings, to declare a basic law unconstitutional. What the heck is that? And so he wants to make basic laws immune to judicial review. That's a piece of legislation that is part of this reform. And Shas needs that and demands it. It's the only way to get Arya Derry into government. There's just one problem. <laughs> 
this reform does not include what they call rigidity, which is making a basic law difficult to overturn. Israeli basic laws can pass like any laws with simple majorities in the Knesset. And so you have a, a situation in which the Knesset, if basic laws are immune to judicial review, which again, I think they really should be, but because there's no rigidity, you're going to be able to pass a basic law that for anything at any time, you're just going to slap the words basic law at the top, and anything can become part of the Constitution within a week, within a week of a little bit of voting in the plenum. Any coalition by any majority. And so this is you know something that Shas requires, they can't compromise on, and they also can't make basic laws into a real constitution that's hard to change. Get, make, you know, force the Knesset to change a basic law by 80 votes out of 120. And then it has to be, you know, the, the government has to reach over the aisle and get the opposition in. And then it's hard to change basic laws. Folks, this is not theoretical. Basic laws have been amended in Israel 22 times in the last five years. In other words, the, the Knesset itself doesn't treat the basic laws as a constitution, but it's passing, uh, it's it's elevating their status to constitutional status only when it comes to judicial review. So the reform that's needed and that Shas won't allow to happen is to make basic laws immune, but also make them hard to change. Okay, so in the meantime, the dairy bill has not passed forward from committee this week, at least, but we'll see to be continued. Let's take another party. Uh, let's take United Torah Judaism. What do they need? Moshe Gafni of United Torah Judaism has been very explicit about this. The Likud and religious Zionism have been talking about appointing conservative justices to the court. That's their priority. So they want the part of this reform that's very important to them is the uh, committee. Uh, to appoint judges, the Judicial Selection Committee. They want to reform that and change that fundamentally. But Moshe Gafni of the ultra-Orthodox Ashkenazi Party says, you know, what do I care if the judges are merits judges from the you know, far left, so to speak, or Likud-appointed judges? None of those judges might leave intact some of the legislation that I think are fundamental to my way of life. For example, uh, an, a, a blanket exemption for, to the military draft or any national service draft uh, for ultra-Orthodox men. For example, a strengthening of the Israeli state rabbinate, which is unequal. In other words, if you go before a, a religious court in Israel, you do not have a situation of equality, not between men and women, not between different faiths. Um, there is an, a, a Jewish Orthodox rabbinical court, there's a Sharia court for Muslims, there's a Catholic canon law court, and that whole religious system, which exists in a great deal of the Middle East, it exists in Lebanon, we inherited it from the Ottomans, that is something the ultra-Orthodox are very invested in. The rest of Israel doesn't like, and, and a Supreme Court, even of conservative judges, might think that there are problems there, problems of equality, problems of basic due process. And so Gaffney says, to protect my the things that are most sacred to me, I need an override. Part of this reform is the, is the uh, power given to the Knesset to override a Supreme Court decision by 61 votes. In other words, the minimum votes a government must anyway have in the Knesset just to be the government. And so any government will have 61 votes to overturn any declaration by the Supreme Court of any decision or any legislation as unconstitutional or unfair or unequal or any of those standards that they might employ. Any government will just be able to say to the Supreme Court, that was a very nice opinion you just wrote. We're going to treat it as an opinion. You can go away, right? Just completely ignore the Supreme Court. And Gaffney says, it doesn't matter to me who the judges are. It doesn't matter to me what you call your basic laws. There is an old saying uh, by Derry and by other ultra-Orthodox MKs over the last 20 years, I wouldn't legislate the Ten Commandments as a basic law because it has nothing to do with what's in the law. It's how the court will interpret it. So they genuinely don't need the basic law. They can compromise on the basic laws. They can compromise compromise on the, on, the, on the identities and the appointments of judges. They can't compromise on giving the Knesset coalition the ability to override any Supreme Court decision because they can force a coalition to vote with them. They can't force a court, even a conservative court. Okay, as opposed to that, we have religious Zionism, who is basically, at least in my understanding, all about the judicial appointments. Right. Religious Zionism and Likud, uh, or more specifically, Simcha Rotman from religious Zionism and Yeriv Levine from Likud, are basically a single camp. There are a few minor differences between some of the bills that Rothman proposed versus Levine proposed. But their focus, and this is something that's been noted by many, many journalists uh, who have spoken with them, and, and they themselves will never admit that they were open for compromise on the other issues. But 
quietly behind closed doors, they are telling people that the, the key for them is conservative judges. Part of the reform says that we're going to cancel the court's ability to use the reasonableness test, right? Ruling that a government decision or piece of legislation is unreasonable and thereby canceling it. Well, they're going to cancel the reasonableness test so the court can't rule things unreasonable. But that's a very... That's not something that either Yariv Levine or Sinchal Rothman think are essential to the reform because judges are very, very good with words. Lawyers generally are very good with words. And if if they are no longer allowed to throw something out because it's unreasonable, then they'll throw it out because it's disproportionate. Or, you know, they'll find other legal tests and legal principles and legal words. And so you haven't really limited the court by saying they can't do reasonableness. The one thing they need is to actually appoint conservative judges. Those judges actually have to be people who they choose because of their belief in judicial restraint. And so for them, the fundamental reform, the part of the reform that is the red line, the thing that for them defines the reform, is this change to the Judicial Selection Committee that they're advancing, in which the coalition will have a majority and be able to appoint without the opposition, without any other institution, the Bar Association, the Supreme Court Justices, delegation on the committee, without any other institution be able to appoint any judge they see fit to the Supreme Court. That is their red line. Okay, so Chaviv, we have these different camps that somehow uh, the different cats were herded into the coalition, and now they're all in some kind of sack that uh, essentially our prime minister needs to keep together and not let it unravel. We are seeing, I don't know, maybe signs of it unraveling already when this week two members of the government maybe quit? Did they quit? And I'm talking, of course, about Noam Head Avi Maoz and the minister for the Meron pilgrimage, Meir Porash from the United Torah Judaism Party. Do you see this as some kind of signs of the coalition unraveling at all? No, I think uh, at this particular stage, these are uh, threats. Um, Avi Maoz is uh, very, uh, his issue is is, is fighting a culture war against uh, gender theory and against uh, gay rights and, and against the whole new sort of the last 30 years of, of, of the flourishing of the whole gay rights movement. Uh, he believes that that is the you know end of Western civilization and that is his one issue of his political party. And he was appointed a deputy minister in the prime minister's office. And one of his top priorities was to change parent one and parent two in state forms to father and mother so that we don't accidentally have two fathers or two mothers uh, put their names to a form, you know, that any child needs to register for school or whatever. Uh, and apparently the government bureaucracy doesn't want to act, enact that change, maybe out of ideology of some bureaucrats, maybe just because it's hard to do it in the computer, and maybe because nobody cares what he thinks. He's a deputy minister without a specific job title in the prime minister's office, not even a ministry. Um, so he is very angry, and he published a statement yesterday that said, I haven't been able to change anything, including this question of what's written on government forms, parent one, parent two, or father, mother. And uh, and if I can't, I'll just be in the Knesset. I don't need to be in the government. Now, that's a great idea. He should be in the Knesset and on the government just because he doesn't have a real job in the government. But um, that's true of many ministers, of course. Um, but, um, but he has 48 hours by law from when he announces his resignation to when he is actually resigned. That's tonight. Many, many, many observers believe that this is a this is a maneuver. He is threatening Netanyahu. He has already, by the way, just to not terrify his own base, he has already said, I will be a loyal member of the coalition in the Knesset. So even if he resigns, nothing really changed. Uh, and Netanyahu might give him some kind of powers that he already gave him, but was lying about, was pretending, and now he'll give it to him for real, maybe. Um, Porush is in a slightly more complex situation because the Maron uh, pilgrimage every year, of course, was the site of a catastrophic disaster with dozens dead. And uh, the ultra-Orthodox parties have, have said, you know, we have to build this properly. A lot of the um, other agencies of the state that have responsibility for safety on that site want to also have the power to actually manage it because the police are absolutely frightened that uh, uh, that certain ministers, certain agency infighting will create a new disaster and everyone will come to the police and say, why, you know, you're ultimately responsible for safety at big public events. And so the police have actually been a difficult to work with because they want power to be able to, right, actually, they're going to have responsibility, public responsibility 
ability. They want the power to also make sure it's safe. Uh, and Parush feels that he hasn't been able to work with all these different institutions, and so he th- resigned, which, again, is as much a threat as... Um, it, it, Shas has already announced that it'll be uh, the religious affairs minister, Malkieli, will already take over. Uh, so maybe it's a real resignation, maybe not. It solves no problem, and he's not leaving the coalition. So these are these are minor, you know, bumps on the road. Not anything serious. By 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 the way, minor players dealing with minor issues, tragic issues in the case of Iran, but very very secondary issues. Um, but on the judicial reform, the threats are very real. Gaffney said before entering the coalition, back in the coalition negotiating days, if I don't have an override, uh, we're, this, that's the condition for United Torah Judaism entering the coalition in the first place. Yariv Levin has told Netanyahu and then told the press that he told Netanyahu that if he doesn't get the substance of this reform passed, the major substance, if that's lost in any negotiating process, Netanyahu triggers, he resigns, which is a terrible uh, blow to Netanyahu in his base, in his party. Uh, and so th- there, there is a threat, even if it's not necessarily signaled by these sort of bit players right now who are making noise. Okay, so essentially what you're saying is that this overhaul will likely go through because there's no sign that Netanyahu wants to step down from power. So yes. is it the end of the world? Should we all be taking our money out of the country like so many people I know are doing already? Should we be buying our apartments in Greece to get our golden visa and to get an entree into the European Union? Is it the end of the world here? The simple answer is no. The simple answer is not not at all. Not I'll even, take it. Not even close. Basically, Netanyahu's situation is that, exactly like you said, every party needs a different piece of this reform. And so there isn't so a lot of room to compromise for Netanyahu or for the coalition generally, um, even though each political party, separate part of the coalition, is talking about all the things they can compromise on. But because they're all different things, pieces of the of the overall reform, the overall reform actually cannot uh, be reined in too much uh, by the politics of the coalition itself. And so what we're likely to see is in the next six weeks or so, depends on some of the scheduling, but basically in the next six to eight weeks, th- this version of this reform, the version that has terrified half the country, actually pass into law. That is very, very likely scenario. I would even say it's more likely than not. We're seeing already chaos in the streets today in particular. We're recording on Wednesday. There's uh, public disturbances throughout the country. But even earlier in the week, of course, we saw in the aftermath of the killing of the two brothers that there was... I would call it a pogrom that ha- took place in an Arab village in which, dare we say it, the Otsma Yudit voters electorate stormed an Arab town and torched it. And one man died from that. What can Netanyahu do now? Does he have any credibility now that he's, I don't know, sold part of his principles in order to push through this overhaul? He has handed um, a lot of the specific control of the West Bank, including law enforcement in the West Bank, to Ben Gvir and Smotrich, who for the 12 hours during and after um, the attack on Hawara were, were just completely missing. I mean, they're literally, I mean, uh, between the two of them, they put out a single tweet. Um, and, and then Netanyahu at midnight, the attack began at 6 p.m. At midnight, Netanyahu convened his own security briefing with the heads of the security services and essentially took over the situation. And, and since then, Likud has been, uh, briefing reporters about anger at Ben Gvir especially, um, and, and his behavior. Otsma Yudit and Likud are right now very angry at each other. Otsma Yudit didn't show up for an important uh, coalition vote yesterday in the Knesset as an act of, you know, as a statement to Likud that they're upset. Uh, and so Huara really did step in, you know, sort of cut into the coalition and begin to sort of pry apart a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of mutual recriminations happening a little bit behind the scenes inside the coalition. Um, but there is a sense, and a lot of it is Ben Gvir and Smotrich, and certainly around the West Bank, but but also on the question of the judicial reform, that Netanyahu is not the strong party here. He is not able 
to you said herd cats it is it is feels like herding cats and he's failing to do so we have a, a state budget now that is just ballooned and and uh, by by tens of billions of shekels in the middle of an inflationary period and against the warnings of the bank of israel and the treasury and frankly global banks and investment firms um and so there is a sense that that the coalition the the tail is wagging the dog so to speak and the prime minister is not fully in charge that is a sense on the on, on the right you hear that in likud you, you don't just hear that you know um from yair lapid who's supposed to say that no matter what's happening right um look i think it's one of the great questions that israelis are asking is how do we separate out just human folly and chaos from genuine danger is the country about to lose its democracy you know, because whether the Netanyahu has firm control of his coalition or not, there have been chaotic governments in the past, right? But is this judicial reform going to leave us without any checks and balances? Are we really in a moment of absolute historic danger? Should the Supreme Court, as Mandelblit said, consider it its duty to force a constitutional crisis? Are we at revolution time? I think that if it tries to do that, then that will be a terrible tactical mistake. It'll also be a principled mistake. Let me frame it the way I'm thinking about it and why I am calm even as the entire country isn't. And maybe it's because I'm the idiot, which is entirely possible. But every single issue that is now burning on the Israeli agenda, that is now tearing the Israeli people apart, isn't new. Nothing that's happening now is new. The Supreme Court fight and the debate and the screaming and the shouting and the questioning of whether we have a democracy and where it's going... All of it is very, very old. And the question of the West Bank, is it a disaster that there was this massive attack and burning of a Palestinian village while the ministers who have been screaming about how they're in control of the West Bank for the last two months disappeared in the middle of the crisis? Is that a disaster? Or is it a finally a, a reckoning? In other words, it, it put the West Bank and the Palestinian situation on the agenda in a way that it hadn't been on the agenda before. We have 13 Israelis murdered in terror attacks over the last month, and that has caused a lot of anger at this government, including on the right, right? Asking, you know, where are you? How are you reigning in this terror? How are you cracking down on it? And there is a sense that the government isn't doing that well. When there were terror attacks under the Bennett Lapid government, the first person to scream at every terror attack about how the government was was col collaborating with terrorists was Benjamin Netanyahu. And now the Israeli right is saying 13 dead in a month is is, is something the government maybe should get on, right, and take care of. Uh, but Huara also showcased the Jewish side of that. There is a lawlessness in the West Bank, especially in certain parts of the settlement movement, and a leadership now in the coalition that has Netanyahu, uh, you know, um, essentially on these questions hostage. He can't do much to rein them in. Uh, and they support tacitly or implicitly uh, uh, a lot of the, a lot of the, you know, the political forces on the ground, the settlement movement, that branch, that very radical branch of the settlement movement that is engaging in this violence. And now that this violence has spiked in that very big and dramatic and photogenic way that every Israeli saw that on television and there's a Palestinian town burning literally in the night while the Israeli rampagers are, are, are praying their evening prayer in the burning town, people are having a new conversation. Every single question about the West Bank, about the Palestinians, questions that Smotrich has no answers, not for the Palestinians and not for the rest of Israelis. Where are we going in the West Bank? What is the ultimate? You know, there there are, have been a couple of interviews of Itamar Ben-Gvir and Bitsala Smotrich over the last month or so, where they just were asked point blank, you guys want to annex the West Bank? You want to take it all over? There's no Palestinian people. We don't have to worry about Palestinian statehood or separation of any kind, not even in the Trump land version, not, certainly not in a you know, 67 lines version that maybe Merritt's wants. There's, you just don't want to talk about a Palestinian state of any kind or Palestinian independence of any kind. So what happens to Palestinians? What happens to 3 million Palestinians that we rule over in the West Bank? And they were unable to give an answer. And they're sitting there, you know, hemming and hawing on television, and these videos circulate in the Israeli, you know, social media space. And so there are these big questions about the court. This is a court that is massively powerful, overpowerful, incredibly activist. Um, and the reform to limit it is ex so extreme that it essentially neuters it completely. The Knesset will simply be able to utterly ignore the court and will no longer have a court of any kind, not, not on the American scale, not on the British scale. We'll have a court that really can't step in and be a check in any way on the Knesset.
All of these big questions that have been real are now coming to a head. This is a moment of decisions. That's not a bad thing. Moments of decision are painful, but they're not bad. One of the worst parts of this budget that was presented to the Knesset yesterday was that a lot of the subsidies for Haredi men so that they cannot work have been expanded. We're going to be spending billions on ensuring uh, my taxes are going to ensure that other people in this country don't have to work for a living and I'm going to have to work to pay for that. That is not sustainable. It's not sustainable morally. It's not sustainable politically. I'm a little bit angry about this budget. I, an ordinary Israeli who pays high taxes, but also it's not sustainable numerically, mathematically. Haredim used to be 5% of the population. We could afford it. They're 15 now, and they're growing faster than the rest. We can't afford it pretty soon. Haredi, the Haredi community in Israel has gotten used to irresponsibility. They have no responsibility for its national security, no responsibility for running a serious economy, for fiscal restraint, for thinking carefully about the future of, 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 of the welfare state. They're growing too big to be irresponsible. Is that a terrible thing? Is that a disaster? Or is that a moment of decision? And so on all these questions, on the West Bank, on the Supreme Court, on separation of powers, on our Constitution generally, which we never sat down and thought carefully about and never made decisions about, on the Haredi society that has grown too big to remain a question mark, Israel is reaching a point of decision. And I think it will come through. You think Israel will come through. Everything you're describing is a chaotic uh dust storm of terribleness, essentially. And yet you're an optimistic person. And so am I, of course. Anyone who has multiple children in this country, we are optimistic people. But is our Zionism dying? Are we watching it go up in flames? And are the real Zionists those who are leaving, fleeing? There's a huge, first of all, I, I don't know the numbers are at all serious, are all large. Israelis are it's very strange because we are a country in permanent state of constant crisis, and right now those crises are really at a head, and everyone feels them very viscerally. They're also one of the happiest peoples on Earth, according to UN well-being indices that are published every year. I mean, literally, the top 10 countries in the world, I think the top four are all Scandinavian. The highest-ranked country on that list, I believe number six, if I'm remembering right from two months ago, uh, the highest country on the list that isn't Northern European is Israel. Israelis have strong, tight-knit communities and families, which is not true of most of the West. Most of the West is very mobile. Most people don't live with their parents and grandparents. Most grandparents don't help raise kids. And so families are smaller. And this is just what, what sociologists call social capital in Israel is enormous. Jews and Arabs alike, large, tight-knit, traditional families, plus a half of the country that's very liberal and you can live in Tel Aviv and be as liberal as any Western country and a more traditional parts, you know, more traditional areas of the country and communities. Israel is very diverse and Israel is incredibly strong and happy. And that's measurable scientifically. <laughs> and we're going through these terrible crises. And so you, you have to ask yourself, are we at a moment of, are, are we collapsing? Like some of these people say, or um, parts of the chattering classes, I think, or, are we reaching, again, these points of decision in which this country has to make these choices? And those choices are going to be painful. Growing up is painful. Taking responsibility is agony. Worst thing that ever happened to me was growing up. H have you grown up yet? In some way. Don't ask my kids. But the point is, that doesn't make it not critical and not a source of real deep happiness, even if it's hard. There's a wonderful Israeli uh, Anglophone uh, essayist and writer, Hillel Chalkin, who recently wrote all of his um, anxieties in this amazing essay in the Jewish Review of Books, in which he argued that Israel is actually facing collapse. And a lot of people wrote, you know, that no, he's wrong, and we should be more optimistic. And but he's a man with a deep sense of the of the of the deeper sort of currents of Israeli culture and of Jewish culture. And in his response essay uh, to the optimists, he said something that he that I thought was really interesting because it's kind of a distilling of, of optimism, optimism that acknowledges that everything could completely collapse. By the way, you're not going to die, right? I'm not going to, we're still going to be here. We're still going to fight for whatever we think is the best, right? Everything still remains. There is no apocalyptic cliff off which you drive. There's always the next morning, the sun always shines, and there's always good to be fought for, no matter what side of the political spectrum you're on. Um, and he has this wonderful paragraph that I have here about the sort of radical fringes of, of the 
Well, not really radical. I mean, about the many, many protesters who are saying, this is, we're turning into a dictatorship. And he says, the liquidation of democracy can have horrendous results, but it's reversible and it doesn't spell the end of nations. Argentina survived its junta, Greece its generals, and Spain quickly caught up with the rest of Europe after 30 years under Franco. Israel is not, in the worst of cases, about to become a dictatorship. He writes this paragraph. Um, is that po- optimistic or pessimistic? I don't know. But he writes this paragraph in the middle of an essay in which he says, no, actually, this country is turning into something worse than what it was. And 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 a lot of it is religion and a lot of it is a, ter- a tilt toward conservatism that is not tolerant and not tolerant of half the country, never mind of Palestinians or never mind of the world. And And he's very worried about this country. And then he says, but you know what? What's the worst case scenario? We will survive the worst case scenario. There is a famous pop song by Ari Einstein, one of the great singers of Israeli history, uh, called Shira Shayara, the Song of the Caravan, about the immigration to the land of Israel from all the dozens of different countries that Jews fled in the 20th century. And one of the most powerful lines and wonderful lines in that song is, she, she being Israel, is stronger than all of our weaknesses. We're going to fight, we're going to scream, we're a society that for all the anxiety and, and insanity of its public discourse is measurably one of the happiest in the world. I don't know how that works. Maybe the two are connected. Maybe if Americans were less calm, they're not calm, they're divided as well. So I was, <laughs> but, but we have these incredible strengths alongside these absolute weaknesses and indecision that have lasted generations and from which Israelis have suffered. And of course, Palestinians have suffered terribly and all of the, everything everybody knows. And yet we have these strengths that will still be there when we drive ourselves into that brick wall, maybe it's time to punch through some brick walls and and, and get to those decisions. Khaviv, thank you very much. Thanks, Amanda. Wednesday night, Israelis who had seen liberal Tel Aviv in turmoil that day tuned into primetime news at eight to see whether this increased violence and chaos in the streets would prompt Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to slow down the judicial overhaul that was rocketing ahead through the Knesset even as tear gas was deployed on Israeli citizens. Netanyahu did address the nation and, like a father chiding his miscreant children, compared the anti-overhaul protesters who are stopping traffic and disrupting the nation to those rampaging Israelis who torched the Arab village of Hurara earlier this week. Just ahead of Netanyahu's speech, four lawmakers from opposition member Benny Gantz's National Unity Party and Netanyahu's Likud issued a joint statement calling on all parties to reach a broad agreement. Netanyahu, however, is clearly determined to charge ahead. Thanks to our producer Gilad Brownstein and to my podcast partner Jessica Steinberg. Thanks as always to my fellow podcast ponderer Mick Weinstein. Have a comment for What Matters Now? Write us at podcast at timesofisrael.com. Enjoy What Matters Now? Please subscribe wherever you find your podcasts. Until next time, Shalom. Shalom.